Okay, let's talk about design. Charette, one of my favorite things. Is there any architects in the room? Good, we can talk about them then. <laughs> I was, uh, being an engineer, I'm not always understood as clearly as I think I should be by architects. Um, there was a fellow that was talking about the caste systems in India. He's never been to an engineering architect meeting. Um, it's whoever has the mostest there wins. So if there's more engineers and fewer architects, then that's how the power struggle goes. Truthfully, and all kidding aside, a charrette, I heard the term the first time. I was one engineer and there was two architects, and they were talking amongst themselves. And they said, well, let's have a charrette on this. And I said, excuse me, what's a charrette? And they looked at me like, oh, you, you, you're yanking our chain. And they ignored me and kept on going. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go look it up. Turns out all a charrette is is a meeting. That's just a fancy word for a meeting. So I've come to the conclusion that it's a plot um, with the architects, that they have certain words that they're not going to tell the rest of the world. <laughs> now, if you want to get even with an architect with the word charrette, let me tell you how the word charrette started. Back in the 1800s, the place to learn architecture was Paris. The university was here. The students didn't live in the good part of town, so they, they lived out in the slums, sort of like now. They have to take a cart to get to the school, right? And their homework was is that they had to come in and brief the professors on a project, do a presentation, okay? Students being students, even back in the 1800s, didn't do their homework. So they would have these cram meetings going in the cart to the university. The word for cart in French is charrette. So really what it boils down to is these are cram meetings because nobody did their homework. <laughs> so the way I get even with the architects is when I have an architect come up to me and say, let's have a charrette on this, I say, well, you know, being an engineer, I'm a little bit more methodical. Let's plan this out ahead of time so we don't have to have a cram meeting. And they just look at me like, what? So that's my revenge. <laughs> Bottom line is, is a charrette's just a fancy word for a meeting. Building information modeling. This is going to be the future. This is where we sit down and we make the building up instead of on blueprints where you pay 300 bucks and you get these damn things that you, gotta, you can't read, you can't see. Change orders are a nightmare. Imagine this all being electronic, and change orders are automatic. And if the plumber makes a change, how does that affect how the electrician's going to do his work? Are we going to have plumbing pipes running through air ducts? This all gets a coordination. It's, a, it's an electronic trade meeting. How many times have we prayed for trade meetings? Because we're sick and tired of people screwing up our stuff and us screwing up other people's stuff inadvertently, of course. We would never do anything on purpose. The point is, is that this allows us to do a three-dimensional plan. Has anybody ever seen one of these systems in operation? Have you ever seen an architect's three-dimensional uh, uh, display of a house? Anybody ever seen one? Anybody ever done a video game? That's what it's like. If you imagine a video game, it's sort of like that, only you get paid for it, okay? Now, the thing is, is that... Um, Beyond making sure everything fits together correctly before we start working and making uh, change orders easier to see cause and effect, beyond that, we can model the engineering. We can model the energy costs, the energy requirements. We can look at CFMs and things like that. And so we can anticipate certain things. Now, when we get down to commissioning, it makes commissioning a whole lot easier. It also makes troubleshooting a lot easier because if it's not working right, you can start looking at the, it should be like this, and you put a sensor up there and it's not reading that, you know the problem's there, it's a localized problem. <clears throat> One of the things that it's very nice for too, if anybody's ever been in hydronics, is not knowing where all the pumps are hidden. And there might be a Series 100 buried out in the back 40 that you don't know about and never been serviced and it finally broke. And that's what's causing your problems. With a BIM, you'd know about that. But so would have the maintenance guy, so it probably would have been maintained and it wouldn't have been broken to begin with. Right sizing. Let me tell you a quick story about right sizing. It's very easy to not right size. Right size basically says use the equipment that you 
the right size. Size it correctly, install it correctly, and commission it correctly. There was a fellow that uh, writes software for hydronics companies. He told me at one time that their software automatically adds 12% to the actual load for heat. If I was doing a design and I came up with a number, let's say uh, the, the true load is 80,000 BTUs. Let's say that's a true load. And not doing it right to the percentage, but let's say now my computer software is automatically made at 100,000, okay? Now, I've been doing business with him for years and years and years, and I've never disappointed him, so I'm going to make it, instead of 100,000, I'm going to make 110,000, because I don't want you to get into trouble, okay? Mm -hmm. And what he does is he gets this number from me, and he says, damn it, I know Tom is anal when it comes to numbers, and he probably has this thing figured down to the third decimal place, but I don't want to get sued. I have never been sued for somebody having too much heat. So I'm going to add 10%. I'm going to make this 110,000. So he goes to his supplier, and the supplier goes, Whoop. the supplier goes, I don't have 110,000, but I got 120,000, or I have 100,000. And you say, well, you know what? I, I'm not going to go too small on this thing, so let's go 120. Okay, fine. You know, it's 120. All right, good deal. Oh, by the way, you know, the manufacturer, the Viega boys over there, they got a special going. If you buy 130000 you get a baseball cap and a jacket and a chance for your wife and you to go to Florida. Oh, okay, well, sign me up for the 130. I, I, you know, I can use a baseball cap and a jacket. Oh, you know what? I just looked on the list. I got 140,000 that I can give you 20% off because it's in our scratch and dent. 20% off. Do I still get the baseball cap and the jacket? <laughs> yeah, I'll give you that. So now a true load is 80,000. The true load of the building is 80,000. What size furnace or boiler did I just back up to the house? 140,000. Short cycling and all that kind of stuff. Let's talk about what happens when we oversize. The cost of oversizing. <laughs> it short cycles. Who had the camera on me during lunch? Uh, it short cycles. Its initial costs are higher, right? If you oversize the BTUs, you have to have bigger uh, ducts, right? And get bigger pipes. So your first cost is higher. Your life expectancy is lower, and there's all kinds of issues. Okay. Deconstruction. Please, 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 in the green community, do not use the word demolish. They will tar you, feather you, and come after you with pitchforks and torches. Demolish means what? It goes into the dumpster and goes into landfill. Deconstruction means I'm stealing the bricks from his house and using them in mine. It's a more responsible approach to taking apart a building and using what you can use. Okay? Deconstruction. Construction waste management plan is just basically that. What are you going to do with your waste? Let's recycle the recyclables and uh, destroy what we have to. Minimize what goes to the landfill. And you use as much as you can. 